Thank you for sharing part of your Wednesday evening with us to officially launch the third Hack for Congress event, Hack for Congress DC. And welcome to the Microsoft Innovation and Policy Center. Thank you, Microsoft, for hosting us. And thank you to the amazing slew of sponsors, supporters, and organizers who have been instrumental in making the next two days of hacking possible. Um, I said this is the third. We did one in Cambridge, did one in San Francisco, and now we're here in DC. And I think the fact that we've got 40 problems shared by members of Congress on our hackpad, we've got 12 senators and congressmen joining us in person who have said, I give a damn about creating a better institution. Um, and the fact that all of us are here on a beautiful Wednesday evening speaks volumes to where we are as a movement. So I'm Seamus Kraft, and I, I'm the co-founder and executive director of the OpenGov Foundation. Um, we at OpenGov have been presenting Hack for Congress with Harvard University's Ash Center. Do we have any Harvard Ash folks in here? We do not, but when they come in, make sure to thank them because they're awesome. Um, before I launched OpenGov, I spent four years in the trenches on Capitol Hill, fighting every single day against information overload, a paucity of resources, lack of human capital, those jerks on the other side of the aisle, and everything that goes with working in an institution that is outdated. I wish, God, I wish we had hacked for Congress back then. Why? Well, because these really insidious technical procedural and data problems add up fast. They made my life miserable, and they meant that we as an institution were not serving our constituents e efficiently and effectively. Everybody on Capitol Hill is walking around knowing that it could work. But no one or few are willing to stand up and raise their hand and say, I don't know, please help, and thank you for helping me make this place work better. As a beleaguered congressional staffer, uh, I feel for where the institution is today, and I think that's the power that drives all of this. Um, so what is Hack for Congress besides a snappy hashtag? Um, really, it's all about those problems. It's about bringing us together and creating a space where people can actually talk about what's wrong and fix it. It's very simple, but it's never been done before. Uh, and what our August panel here is going to talk about is what we need to do to go beyond a two-day hackathon to changing the way Congress does business on a daily basis. That's the culture change we are all in this room seeking in our own ways. And that's what the panel is going to talk about today. Um, with that, I want to introduce our panel moderator, journalist Nancy Scola, who is a reporter and writer whose work focuses on the intersection of technology and politics, policy, and civic life. For nearly a decade, her coverage of everything from how tech is changing the art of political campaigning to the ongoing policy debate over net neutrality has appeared in The Atlantic, The Washington Post, Reuters, Washingtonian, and the American Prospect, Next City, and many other publications. She's served as a tech policy reporter for the Washington Post, a contributing writer at the American Prospect, columnist at Next City, a tech and political reporter at the Atlantic, and an editor for the Daily Newsletter Tech President. She is also a re recovering congressional staffer, um, who uh, I believe worked for Chairman Waxman. Yes, so we, we bonded over the oversight committee the first time. Um, at the moment, she is, among other things, a contributing editor for Politico. And in a previous life, she worked in the U.S. House of Representatives. Nancy lives and works in Washington, D.C. With that, I will let Nancy introduce our amazing panel of people, and I'll get back in. You didn't leave me a lot to do. I was going <laughs> to introduce the panel, introduce myself. Uh, so ditto to what Shima said. Thank you all for coming tonight. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. We do have a great panel to discuss this topic, and uh, the ambition for the next hour or so uh, is to just frame some of the issues that folks are going to be hacking on in the next two days. What, what do we really mean when we say Congress doesn't work very well? Um, we say it a lot, but there's some real nuts and bolts things that, that, we're, uh, that we're talking about when we sort of talk in that way. And we have a great uh, team up here to talk about that stuff. And to my left is John, excuse me, Rob Pearson. Sorry, Rob. Uh, Rob Pearson was the director. This sounds a little echoey. Is that... Sounds good? Okay. Um, Rob Pearson was the director of new media in, for the House Democratic Caucus until about uh, 2010 or so. Uh, to Rob's left is Joe Trippi. Uh, I think it's probably fair to say he needs no introduction. <laughs> Joe, Joe Trippi is Joe Trippi is a, a Democratic campaign strategist consultant that sort of thing, uh, and uh, runs Joe Trippi and Associates now. Um, to Joe's left is John Sampson. And John is, I'm going to check to make sure I get your title correct, it's Director of Federal Government Affairs at Microsoft. Thanks for being here, John. And to John's left is Dave Vizenich. 
uh, he's a former general counsel for the DC City Council, who about two months ago, I believe, joined up with 18F. Folks know what 18F is? It's Okay, so it's, a, it's sort of a pod of technologists housed within the General Services Administration, which is probably the most exciting thing to happen to GSA in a long time. Um, and uh, uh, it'd be great to hear from Dave directly, sort of what he's found in his, his transition into a federal government technologist life. Uh, so we're going to get started. The folks on the panel are going to give a few minutes of introduction, sort of frame their thoughts on the topic. I might ask a question or two, and then we're going to open it up for questions and uh, comments from the audience. We'd love to make it pretty conversational. So uh, with that, Rob? Uh, can you guys hear me okay? So, uh, I work in uh, the House and Senate, uh, mostly on the member side, leadership side. I have a good cross section. And um, this is just uh, one thing, but just give a quick sort of light to save us down. So, I'm going to see Dr. Dawkins and I were working on a group of plans in the House. And um, in order to Get past all the security restrictions. We're asked to uh, compile Apache from scratch. And anyone that knows uh, what that means can understand what incredible challenges. Uh, the challenges to moving the needle forward in Congress are incredibly difficult working from within. Um, the challenges are things that are incredibly passionate that make it happen. Um, but there's uh, challenges along the way. Uh, one of which is the number of staff in an office. The number of staffers in an office update constantly uh, uh, um, While the, for example, number of postal letters coming into offices has increased tenfold over the past decade, and email increased even farther, and then you have social media out of the mix. And so it becomes an incredible challenge. You know, you can use technology as best you can, but even so, it's a challenge that's nearly impossible with the resources available at members' offices. So it's a, it's a huge challenge, but staff engage uh, with a matter of staff to a great start to fun. Can you just talk a little bit about who asked you to, who directed you to compile Apache from scratch? Is this your boss? Uh, the House and Human Resources, you know, which is very understandable in a web chat. You think about all the individuals uh, we're trying to pack into work and structure. You know, from other nations uh, to internal uh, uh, entities, you know, HIR has an incredible challenge ahead of them, and they're very protective of the infrastructure they maintain. So they face a huge challenge, and they sometimes have to go a little bit overboard. Um, they're they're doing their best with the. Uh, I I wanted to talk a little bit about. Uh, why government is so on uh, everything involved in technology institutions are so extreme uh, with the way they you know, the rules that were set up, laws that were set up, the regulations that were set up for a completely different time and a different era. Uh, my best example of this is in the Dean campaign. Uh, at the time of the Dean campaign, um, the Federal Election Commission's regulations were still at that time that all distribution and, and expenditure had to be reported on paper. Now that was that was written for a time played back in the sixties, maybe the seventies, and uh, the average candidate had a couple thousand contributions during the quarter. He wrote two thousand checks back then, two thousand dollar checks, uh, but no one had thought about it see the day might come for nine thousand in one day on the last using the internet uh mind how possible to be able to put all that together and then oh, by the way any of you have memory of this at all we picked two tiny and to dolly in massive stack of paper. But today, the U.S. Senate, I think some tells me, still requires all the I mean, or a lot of the stuff that they do. The, the fact of the matter is, today, all of us in a campaign can tomorrow morning decide we can't stand the software, 
putting something on, on the machine. If we try to do that in, in government, it's a, all of us today collect shame as president. Are you 35 yet? <laughs> but we could we could we collect him president and bring us all in, and we could have done all kinds of amazing things and invented new things, uh, take taken total advantage of apps and other things that are out there, and then literally get into government tomorrow morning, and it's a massive review procurement. I mean, just different rules. It's not anything. It's not anybody's fault. That there's a lot of very smart uh, and innovative people working inside. But, and this hackathon is, is a, a, a great start, but my own view is there literally has to be this kind of hackathon every single day for four, six, eight years because you can't possibly, government is not set up to possibly deal with the technological change that is happening right now without, you know, that we don't know about today, but that we're gonna like adapt immediately, government is gonna adapt. Last thing is, you have 187,000 people lost their job at that uh, day it went bankrupt. <clears throat> day it sold itself to face a billion bucks. Uh, there were 13, I think something like 13 employees. If that kind of, of shift is happening in something like, like that industry, where is that happening inside government in terms of streamlining using technology the application? To absolutely change the way government does things, you know, money in people's pockets, and all that. A lot of Republicans. So, this anyway, that's. Can you just talk a little bit? We, when we talked in sort of preparation for the panel, we talked about what candidates, you know, if you come into office very excited about the potential of what you can do, is it discouraging? You work with a number of candidates. Is it discouraging for them to? I'm sort of leading the witness here, but is, yeah, do they no, find I it think, discouraging? I think to, it's full staff in. And new members come in. And I think Obama. I think they all thought, "Look, we're going to be able to change uh, the way we use technology and government, uh, and bring people in, and it's going to be great. It's going to be just like a campaign." All of a sudden, you get there, and there's a first 56 machine sitting on your desk, or you know, so maybe a 512. I mean, you get to the point where it turns out because of the Hillary email, and we all find out that Colin Powell walked into the State Department have connected connect to each other. And then he spent the entire time, his, his time as Secretary of State, doing one thing, technology-wise, putting computers on everybody's desk and connecting. And then, you know, and so then we went, you know, there aren't a lot of uh, experiences that people come in and realize that, and it's going to take a lot of just a dinosaur stuff uh, uh, up to speed to, to get off. We're going to go launch as he came in here. So I think yeah, I think that uh, hurts education, hurts. Uh, look, I mean, I, I lasted in government I lasted in government <laughs> because I realized I could have the cure for AIDS and it was dying committee. So it's just that you know, these institutions have rules and methods. So if you see it not working. A lot of ways, but one of the impediments isn't smart. Again, it, we're now talking about stuff that's being at light speed, and government barely sometimes adjust things that over 10 years. John, is it as bad as all that? <laughs> well, I. I should, I, as the Microsoft panelist, first, can I welcome everybody to the Microsoft Innovation Center? We love having having you all here. And uh, you know, to those of you who've been here before, welcome back. To those of you who are here for the first time, please do come back. We, we love those events, and we're always welcome. Um, is it as bad as that? I, I, I think it it can be. I think you know you see uh, you know pockets of progress. You know that that I think. A lot of government agencies, and, and my area of mo familiarity is, is mostly with the Hill, uh, you know that there are, uh, there's a yearning. They know what private industry is capable of. They've seen what happens. They probably have more flexibility on the campaign political side than they do on the official side. So you do tend to see more innovation and more uh, forward-leaning uh, technology um, uh, solutions on the side because they, can, they have more adaptability and they're answerable ultimately to themselves. And, 
and the people who have contributed to the campaign are a public official works under much tighter oversight uh, restrictions and, and knows that everything is subject to scrutiny. And so just in anything you do. As far as the Hill is concerned, though, um, I, I think it's fun to talk about these things because, you know, we can acknowledge that the Hill has made tremendous progress in certain areas, but, every, you know, you, you, can't, you can't rest on any of it because it only exposes how much further you really still have to go. I think, uh, you know, it was only a few years ago that, that everybody anticipated the release of the Golden Mouse Awards, right? The measure of who had the best websites, and I think anybody would acknowledge that today, the notion of measuring your um, technological sophistication by how good your web page is is a little bit antiquated. But, you know, it's, it's the floor. At a minimum, you have to have a web page, a great web page, and, but nobody expects that that is a, a meaningful measure of, of your technological sophistication. I think the, the bar that has been met over the last few years and members of Congress of you know, both parties, House and Senate, all deserve credit, they're online. They, they are, you know, there's hardly an office that is not active on, you know, the full range of social media, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, or, or Google Plus, or, or, you know, some have, uh, and, and Instagram, all of them. And I think that's significant. I think, though, what most of us realize is that these tools are about a conversation. It's a, almost a cliche. You know, we talk about joining the conversation. Yet, when you look at how most members of Congress are using these tools, they tend to use them the way they used the last generation of tools, as broadcast vehicles. It doesn't make sense. You know, back when you were putting out a press release, you're broadcasting it. If you, you know, uh, if you sign up to do um, the feed to the, your local affiliates, you're broadcasting. But if you use these tools that way, you're missing the entire point of them. And I think that that's why I say, as far as we've come, it's now exposed this new issue. I think um, that is the, the next step, uh, because what we see is, you know, people complain on social media. There's a lot of information to be gleaned from that. People talk to their friends. Some people are more influential than others online. We know who they are. There's all sorts of valuable information to a member of Congress that is not being heard, it's not being measured, it's not being benchmarked. And um, I think that, uh, to the extent that we're talking about, you know, um, creating, you know, the, next, the new Congress, more effective Congress, to the extent that a Congress that is more responsive to voters, that's more re responsive to constituents, means having an open ear to them, engaging them the way they want to be engaged, I think it's essential that members of Congress use tools that now enable them to not use, you know, the traditional static measures. How many new, how many likes did I get? How many new, uh, you know, fans do I have of my page? How many new followers do I have on my Twitter, Twitter feed? How many uh, retweets did I get? These are very static ways to measure whether or not we're being effective, whether or not a member of Congress is being effective. I think the, the next step and this is where I'll stop, is figuring out what the right ways to measure sentiment. Are people talking about me? Not forget about my social media accounts. But how about blogs? How about news? How about all these things that I may or may not have visibility into? Are people saying nice things about me or not nice things about me? Are the people responding to the issues that I am trying to drive positively? Are they speaking positively or negatively? How about my opponents? I know what they're trying to achieve. How are people responding to them? All these things give insight. The trend and sentiment analysis is the next step for members of Congress to truly leverage the investments that they've already made in, in social media. Excellent. Great. Uh, well, thank you all for having me. Uh, so I'm Dave Zenich. I'm currently at 18 f and I'll tell you a little bit about it. I was at the T
sort of uh, sort of be the counterpunch to what was is that I actually um, and this is born from my general um, but now also very much in to the PMF. Um, I don't think that government has broken to right? So um, you know the fact of the matter is that it has some pretty low in terms of like uh, what a couple uh, under a year ago or so. Um, and at 18F, um, it has not been Somebody raised their hand so I can. So 18F, fine. Good. Um, all right, so 18F um, is a group of about 100 tech companies. They're designers, developers, UX experts, patients, folks, like a range of technologies. It started with 18 so this was legit start of year ago. Now it is 100 it's continued to grow. Um, it's a startup within government, building modern sites, building size. Um, standards that other agencies are now starting to adopt, sites like Not Alone and Need Buy Extractives and that can learn and CR easy. It's not really on the site, right? Um, and we're building them, they're modern, they're responsive, so you can say modern digital system like and we've changed no laws, right? We didn't even get into the context. like doing this with existing resources, we're doing with existing staff from Pivot bought it from uh, NPR, being in some of the New York Times, and people from all of the uh, private sector, public sector, CFD, from Sunlight Foundation, DC government, on, putting them in. And what we're doing is we're offering them a real uh, opportunity to actually change these things, right? And the way that we're changing them is not through, you know, sort of breaking all of the rules and trying to figure out how we can sort of short circuit all of that stuff. What we're trying to do is we're trying to work in the open and actually experience how we fail, document it, share it with each other and share it with the world, and then learn from it and try to iterate it over and over and over again. And so what's interesting about Congress is that having hacked the Congress is sort of a, a clever, um, it's, it's a clever thing and the hackathon is great, but what would be really, I think, sort of um, a shift for Congress and what could really sort of drive the culture change that I saw when I was general counsel of the DC Council when we opened up the DC code and we started building out apps not just for our internal uses, but actually that other use and work in Chicago, San Francisco, uh, Boston, Philadelphia, we start using ourselves. Um, we actually view ourselves not building for the web, but of the web, right? That this is actually using what the internet has created. Which is a distributed environment where people are building little components and pieces and then together every um, but building their piece that they're particularly expert building it out well and letting someone else who's really particularly good at their particular piece building that and building it out well participating in a way open source doing collaborative and embracing the idea of technology as part of their uh, uh, their model rather than just something that we're on a mission to um, I, I can tell you, I don't think it's going to be easy. I don't think Congress is going to come on. Hey, we're just going to open source all the things. But there are great things happening right now. The House Office of Clerk um, is doing amazing stuff with the House Legislative uh, Council. has a number of projects that are underway that will keep in mind. The Office of Regent Council is opening up the United States Code for time forever. They're doing all this stuff. My only criticism is that they're not doing it in the open. We don't know about it. We're not seeing their source code. And if they did, then other jurisdictions could participate and get involved. Like, this is what we do. It's not like we have to change the world. We just have to change this one little piece and say, we're going to do this in the end. We're going to do this the way that Microsoft, all of the other people who are of the web are actually coming up with. Excellent. Thank you. So, one question I'm going to ask is if, you, if we accept the premise that Congress is not operating at the technological standards of the best of the private sector, right? There, there are good points, there are bad points, but if we say that, you know, it's, it's sort of, um, is not quite at that level, is it inertia? Is it, is it people holding on to power? Is it that we don't want a government that's that responsive and reactive to the latest and greatest in technology? Is it the nature of a legislature that, that they are meant to work sometimes in secret, often collaboratively in a way that's difficult to translate to technology? We just, if, if folks can just respond to it, it sort of in turn about why is it the way that it is? I'll, I'll take a stab at that one. Um, I think there's no one answer. I think the more you talk to, to, uh, to 
members of, of Congress, to their staff, you find very varying levels of technological sophistication. Some, they've come out of private sector. They've been exposed to modern technology. They maybe ran a business that was completely cloud-based. And they're, you know, frankly frustrated to realize that they're working within the limitations imposed on them at the enterprise level by the house. Um, some of those limitations are legit. As, as you mentioned, HIR has a very difficult job to do. They're answerable to a, a privileged class of, of clients. You know, every member's office wants, wants uh, you know, an answer immediately, if not yesterday. And, um, and they want to make sure everything works well. So there's a natural, you know, risk averseness and change resistance. Nobody wants to see anything roll out at the enterprise level that they're not prepared to completely support. And I think that means that they can just go slower than a lot of offices want to go. I think where they could serve themselves well is to give a little bit more freedom to the offices that are not so risk averse. There are plenty of offices and, and they reach out to us and I'm sure they reach out to other companies because they have been either heard about what private sector entities are doing or they themselves did it in their previous you know, um, uh, careers and they now want to take full advantage of modern technological tools, modern business tools. They want to you know, store their data in the cloud. They want to use a modern CRM. They want to do you know, business intelligence and you know, imagine the amount of data that a typical congressional office is collecting daily over the phone, over the web, in snail mail. Combine that with um, all the publicly available data that's uh, you know, on data.gov or census or even from their own Secretary of State. Now you're able to merge stuff and now they can do their own um, you know, ana data analysis. Now they can look for, um, now they can drive the news instead of respond to it. I think you've got a, a, a small subset of offices that actually are willing to push up against the institution but I know that you know, even at the institutional level, there is still an inherent distrust of the cloud. One last point here. Um, there's also a constitutional issue, uh, namely you know, speech and debate clause, which they haven't completely reconciled. You know, right now, they physically possess the business of Congress on their own physical infrastructure. That you know, means that they can protect it. If they entrust the business of Congress to a third party entity and a host, that introduces the question of whether or not speech and debate carries over to that. The lawyer to your left yeah, is shaking there's, his head. There's no. literally no way. The <laughs> court's been very clear that yeah. the speech and debate clause can't be with so, unequivocally. So, so, that's their argument they got. They have so, to, so, we, some we have said that it. this can be easily be solved, and I've heard others say, yeah, we're never going to the cloud. Yeah. I've heard both experts that. That can't possibly be true. <laughs> <laughs> so the answers lie somewhere in between the yeah. okay. range. Rob Jones. I think it is that they, I mean, and I say this as somebody who fully came to the position in the sense that I was there two years ago. I think that they don't know that it's possible. I think a lot of people are looking at what's going on and saying, well, that seems to be interesting to actually have It's just as not resources, it's not more on resources than a lot of uh, other agencies, um, certain private sector um, resources that they see themselves. They just don't didn't go. Um, and I think that this has led to certain having to flow. Right? You're telling oh, open your door. Why? Right? It's only an opportunity to have pop shots by the Washington Post. It's not actually doing it. It doesn't make it perfect. Like the staffer. Um, they don't realize that, you know, the Senate director can just drug track. I just some dude side of um, into built it by himself now using this technology. But they if they started to think about how technology could actually make their lives better and see it and feel it, they're all of a sudden institutional support for doing. It's just a lack of um, not lack of vision because I think they are they have vision, um, but they don't yet have a deep appreciation that what's a, what's possible is actually I, I say, look, uh, it, it's not, uh, government's no 
it's not any different than a lot of companies out there. A lot of corporations out there don't still haven't figured out what to do with social media or you know what they should be doing about cybersecurity or any number of, of, of tech issues. The the difference I, I think is that um, you know if Kodak doesn't get that it should do, be doing something different so out of it, a lot of out of thing. Um, government just be, again because of all these issues constitutional yeah that can't oh, possibly I'm not yeah yeah no but I'm just saying all kinds of different issues. Um, and like I said, it has nothing to do with how smart some of the people are or what others do. It's just a lot slower to, to, to make any big, big move. And what I'm more worried about situation is, you know, as technology, you know, computing capacity level half the size, I mean, every, you know, we, we start moving into more just sort of exponential change and disruption. Because of uh, this great technology that can save a lot of problems, solve a lot of problems, government isn't, it's going to be catching up while the world is away. Not, again, any fault, and I think that's something that we need to start really thinking about. Um, because unlike, like I said, unlike Kodak, it went out of business, and, you know, uh, government got to adapt in a lot faster is uh, I think a lot of the things we're talking about you guys are doing it uh, you know it is important and actons are important that's what I meant I think literally some kind of tech or it's constantly inside the government but, you know it's not a hundred but uh, we're trying to scale <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah but lots of and and the government putting real resources uh, would be one of the most Things Congress can do, not how we do. We can just act. Yeah. You know, that's what this is. Which just as a quick follow-up, it seems to raise a question of whether there is political advantage for a candidate, for a sitting member, in being good at this stuff, right? If it if it helps you do your job, and people see it help that it helps you do your job, that would that would something that they might be regular to do. Can you sell a candidate saying, Senator X running for your election is really good at using technology? In their job, does that help at all in this sort of campaign context? Or you can always. <laughs> no, I don't mean that. I'm just being honest. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think it's more important, um, like veterans. Yeah. Can help technology somehow couldn't. Yeah. So at least solve things out there. If privately assigned to a hospital, or something, should there just should be a way. That. Um, and. You know, give me six hundred people on, on just that, just doing that. that would solve a lot of problems. I'm not talking about just like I said, I think there's a lot of great work about the Senate about they their system sort of the bigger there's some bigger really answerable problems if you put enough brain power in into in to the tech and make things work that you know, real there are veterans that really were waiting for and are still way, and I think there's a way to, uh, we, you know, there's got to be some way to, to, to at least identify who they are, get them on some kind of track, and put and connect doctors out, even if it's a volunteer doctor, of course, that's still willing to see them. That's yeah. better than what we've got going right now. And then you probably get into some trouble with the VA not being able to use a volunteer doctor to see a vet. I mean, that this is where I start, you start to lose me, not because I'm the government or anything. I'm starting to sound like a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll cut you off then. Um, uh, Rob, the, the sort of power inertia question, or is that just the power inertia? There's a funny thing. Uh, so, um, it's, it's, it's a great guy. Uh, one of his priorities was transparency. So he was able to um, pass a uh, rate of light uh, in some ways, uh, language that created a to address a lot of these issues. Well, probably one of the proudest things I've done. So we got a pass, and a lot of people on board, and all of a sudden there were these things and we didn't know what was going on. And uh, it turned out that there was like, presumably like one staffer in like one city was too fast. And we never knew like what 
objection. I've got a one person, you know, some two o'clock, but a prompted gotten past uh has prompted power, but uh the really nice thing is just like oh this is that forward compass down to where the super cluster the stress and you know basically integrating with subtract, you know, jump towers maybe and um, they pushed, and they kept pushing, and they kept pushing, and they kept pushing. And eventually, uh, Democrats helped in the House and all these pushing, pushing, till this group started, and they pretty substantial traction. So, the people are passionate. Some people are passionate. Um, but it's progress is for Excellent. So I'm going to do a quick lightning round, and then um, if people can think of questions and comments, we'll open it up after this. Uh, if you had to, as a result of hacking, fix one thing in the House or Senate or both uh, over the next few days, what would what would you fix? What is the one the one thing that you'd love to check the box on? Is it getting newer technology in there? Is it opening up data? Is it being more responsive on social media? What is the one thing? What? Dave? I'd love to Okay. Explain that in more words. So we have a bunch of vendors who are asked to do other parts of just to do it, offer changes, or fork it so that they can. Okay, John. That's a tough, tough question. One, <laughs> what's the one thing that uh, I think they should do? To uh, change the way Congress works with constituents, or how it functions as an institution. Either. Um, you know, I think a lot of the data transparency, giving uh, uh, constituents earlier and better exposure to the legislative process, you know, give, you know, that doesn't mean that every uh, every voter has an opportunity to edit every bill. But I think that a democracy is stronger when uh, there is more transparency. I think most voters, most citizens, feel quite insulated from from the way Congress works and and that it doesn't affect them that they don't matter that their voice isn't heard the more uh, you can facilitate transparency and visibility into the construction of our laws the more you engage them and frankly i think that's um particularly helpful because now they are not getting the filtered view that they typically get from the from the particular uh voices that validate their per political perspectives. I think the more that you can get citizens to get their own information directly from sources, less from from those those validators. Uh, and by validators, I mean the people who see things strictly from their own political perspective and make them feel like it's validate their own personal perspective. So that's net positive. Uh, authorizing fund tax tax and and if they save money, that money goes in tax for tax. Hmm. Um, so you sort of incentivize and, and I, otherwise open source would be right. Uh, one word that strikes terror in part of uh, any staff like right. <laughs> Basically, the Franking Commission is a question that uh, determines what you can say in applications. <laughs> and incredibly, or it was at least a very incredible uh, process. Very uh, is to make sure that people use or But the practice of once they're off, you would have these like files that was, like, that was like, And they, you know, tell you what you could say. Other words, in a particular time, entirely different. Excellent. Okay, let's open it up. Um, do we? I'm sorry. Do we need the microphone to go around, or? We? Oh, excellent. All right, we have a lot of hands and not too much time, so I think if we, um, if we sort of keep things concise. Absolutely. Here, we'll just start here on those. So. Uh, thanks. <clears throat> First, on the legal issue, um, I 
my boss's website uh, 18 years ago was one of those brought in, and the reason we were given uh, was that uh, separation of powers where uh, an outside host would be served um, with a subpoena and they wouldn't have to go through the sergeant of arms. Um, that was the reason we were given then. Um, I would posit that the Congress is way out front of a lot of the private sector, that actually some of the greatest tech things have been ha taking place there. CRM, Lockheed Martin has one of the best CRM tools. Uh, if you have staffers who know how to use it, it does just amazing things. Uh, laws have been drafted in XML for almost, not 15 years, but on that order. Um, Kirsten, uh, who's here, is uh, a tech core, unbelievable resource. Um, Pat Case from the Library of Congress uh, pioneered using uh, XML XQuery for full text. If you could go, go through and see some of the major advances, Dave sort of talked about it a little bit, but uh, I would say if you had been today at the Legislative Data and Tech Transparency Conference that Reynolds Schweikart of the Committee on House Administration had, you would have heard some of the, some of the most amazing things uh, that are happening in technology that outstrip a lot of the private sector. So I just want to posit that. Did you, on this question, somebody mentioned the idea of just talking about it more. Is that something, do you think there would be a benefit to that if they just, they don't do a great job publicizing this the, uh, the advances that are made by inside the Library of Congress or? Um, back in 2001, I co, I, I set up the first XML conference. Uh, for the past four years, the Committee on House Administration has had a yearly legislative data and transparency conference. Um, it's not marketed well enough, but we have people from NARA, GPO, uh, this year, the Secretary of the Senate sent someone over, uh, HIR, uh, Clerk of the House. So we do, because I'm now, uh, I do have a, a contract with the uh, uh, Committee on House Administration right now, but uh, even the years I haven't, I was a big fan because there is some openness and Reynolds Schweikart has done a fantastic job of that. So, um, and, and some of the people are here seated in the audience, so take advantage of them. Okay. Excellent. I'm just going to jump over. Hi, uh, my name is Roey. I'm the executive director of an NGO called Not In My Country. And what we do is we create web and mobile applications that empower citizens to record, report, and uh, litigate against corruption, essentially crowdsource evidence, turn it into litigation. Uh, we actually started off doing this in East Africa, but we're now interested in doing it in the United States. And I was wondering if, uh, if each one of you could just uh, tell me what sectors you think in the U.S. government have the biggest problems with corruption and what point of leverage perhaps laws or oversight agencies exist to, to help stop that. Good question. Um, well, we do, I mean, we do want to keep the focus on Congress a little bit here. I mean, if we could, if folks had any perspective in terms of, we should probably limit our focus a bit on that. Well, I mean, right, so this is not my area of expertise, but I think that there's an Office of Congressional Ethics, and it's the yeah. ready and available to anybody who wants to file a complaint. There's ethics committees in both the House and the Senate. They're both available to both, for both uh, internal uh, inquiries and, and referrals and, and external. So I'm not sharing anything that, that isn't publicly available, but um, I, I, I would, you know, I, I'd the work I'm, you're doing, I'm sure, is very important. At the same time, I'm one of those who believes that notwithstanding very well-publicized ethical breaches, Congress is probably more ethical today than it's ever been at any point in history. And I say that because they're under greater scrutiny. The 24-7 news cycle means that they're, they're, the fact that they're never off camera. You know, every once in a while, yes, we're all amazed that somebody made the exact same mistake that somebody else made, and you can't believe that they did it. Um, but the fact that that, that we learned about it tells us that you know this era of sunlight and transparency and you know some of you have been you know, had your phones up none no one none of us are ever you know um, can take comfort that we are um, at complete safety of not being recorded in some way I think that those you know that you know I, like I said I, I I tend to believe that Congress is more ethical today than, than 
than it has been in the past. Hi, I'm, I'm Daniel Schumann. Um, I, I think there might be some aspects of this conversation that, that we may have sort of glossed over. Uh, one, of course, is that the House of Representatives has just put into its rules this Congress that there must be uh, public access to legislative information in bulk. And a lot of this is long-derived work of what Rob has you know, worked on for a very long time. I think there's also institutional aspects that we're looking at. We're talking about the House and the Senate. We're not talking about the legislative support agencies. We're not talking about the legislative support offices. One of the great stories that I'm going to beg Rob to tell at some point is going to be uh, how the Democrats and Republicans came to work together in the House and in the Senate as a way of fighting back some of the efforts among uh, the legislative support agencies to stop access to this kind of information. And that's a, that is an untold story. Uh, but the final point that I would like to make, if you look at Congress right now, if you look at the House of Representatives, there are a thousand less committee staff right now than there were a decade ago. Uh, if you look at average staff pay for a staffer, it is exactly the same adjusted for inflation as it was in 1985. If you look at the number of people available to do the kind of work, it's down. GPO, uh, sorry, GAO is down 1,500 folks. The budget for the House of Representatives is down 11% in the last four years. This is not the kind of cuts that you see in the executive branch. This is not the kind of cuts that you see in the private sector. What, what a lot of is going on here are questions about capacity and politics. No politician will ever say, things are going great in this country. Let's go spend another 10% on the budget for staff. It just doesn't happen. But everyone says, well, you know, we have to, uh, belt tightening starts at home, and we're going to do this by, by cutting staff. And we're seeing this now. We've, we've cut through the meat. We've cut through the bone. We're, we're choking off the ability of Congress. We're pushing a lot of the power from Congress to those like me who lobby Congress. Uh, so what I'd like to address is not um, sort of the technical details, but the political aspects of this. How do we continue to reframe the discussion so that people believe that investment in technology, investment in staff, investment in resources in our legislative branch is something that is actually worth doing and not something that is really viewed as a giveaway to these fat cat staffers who live in their wonderful, you know, uh, their lives here in Washington, D.C. In their, in their townhouses that they have to share with five other people. So that's, that, I hope, is something that, that you guys can, can hopefully address. <laughs> That I would say, and that, first of all, that, that's totally right. And it's not just true of the Congress, it's true of the legislatures in America. The real shame uh, that they're under resourcing themselves uh, to, to the detriment of oversight. But the metaphor that is often applied to, to technology is the notion of transparency. It's a good thing, um, but so I would sort of members of Congress um, technology is like the equivalent of saying back to your districts you have to take courage as opposed to train, train, drive. That's insane. You would never say, okay, we need to get back to California and take the answer. That's just what it happens. But that's what they're doing with their own resources with respect to responding to constituents and. They are so underutilizing the technology and not using it essentially quite. Um, I'm not talking to the but they, Congress needs to realize that it's not just about making Congress more transparent and um, publicly accessible. It's about actually letting Congress do the work that members of Congress need to do on a day-to-day -day basis and their staff. But, you know, the other thing is, Congress is responsible for doing that. I mean, look, they, they all of them leave and go back home, and most of them rant about this terrible town and how they hate it and how you can't get anything done, and they're fighting those other guys in Washington, and they, both sides do it. And so guess what? There's no constituency out there to fund more Washington st staff, stuff, whatever. And it's, it, you know, and... That's just, I mean, from being on the campaign side, that's, you know, the American, look at any poll, you know, there's not a lot of love in this place or, or Congress. And that, that gets reflected in, you know, the best way to go is how much money you save in your office and all that other good stuff, you know, all kinds of different parachute reasons. All of that, I agree with you.
but part of it is turning your fan. I don't think presidential. <laughs> I'll I'll agree with your premise. I, mean, I, I I'm a former Hill staffer. I know many of us are. Um, um, many of, of you are still working on the Hill. The work that congressional staff do, I'm, and I love your expression, I never thought I'd hear those three words together, fat cat staffer. I mean, they just don't go because we all know nobody goes to become a congressional staffer because you know they think they're gonna be able to buy a beach house doing it. It's, that's why I love it. <laughs> but it, it, it speaks to the nobility and the importance of the work. You find people who are committed and enjoy it. It's an amazing place to work. Um, at the same time, I, I I disagree with I disagree with okay something you said. You do see a lot of belt tightening going on in corporate America. I know at my company we we had some massive layoffs last year. Uh, first time you know we had layoffs at Microsoft in the scale that we did. It wasn't fun. It wasn't easy. You find budgets getting cut throughout uh, you know corporate America for all sorts of things that that are not core to the business. You find companies making really hard decisions about all aspects of their business. And so, you know, the only difference is that we're doing them because we're not insulated from market forces. Congress is, and I think that's the thing you know, Joe was speaking to that I totally agree with you. It's hard to go and, you know, anybody, any of you who work on the Hill know that your bosses hear these kinds of things. When they go home, they want, they're answerable for you know, their own, their own staff, their own activities, the amount of money that gets spent everywhere. Fair or unfair? So, I'm sorry. So I think we're not going we're not going to solve everything tonight. Um, but it's great to get enough, uh, plenty of ideas sort of onto the floor. So um, if we we have about five minutes left, and is there anybody on that side? I'm trying to go back and forth. No. Okay, we're here in the. I'm gonna go. I'm sorry, in the waiting room. Oh, there we go. Yeah, hey, how's it going? Uh, Ted from Capitol Bells. Uh, first, absolutely ridiculous that Congress is more ethical than it ever has been. It's tough to say that. Um, but the question is, and I work with them every day. <laughs> I just work on the Hill too. Um, what are the arguments that you, that you hear against opening congressional data services? And can someone define what we're talking about? Bill data, vote data, any other? Well, so I think any. So I, I, for those people who sort of, for a lot of people, who I've, you know that I've, up to, so like stuff that we don't like think, but actually just like really be to the member site, like unique identifier for the member site, like, kind of data to really really, just like, just that. Be nice, right? Like just doing be simple. Um, that is all useful. I think that broader sense, um, there's a there's a rich amount of information. Rational researcher work. And there, there's just a huge amount of information that Congress has uh, is not made available to accessible. So I don't. There's not a way to RL to. Same 
2015. Um, but like that sort of stuff is not, I haven't heard anyone say, well, that's a bad idea. We should not have permanent code. I do have people make right citing United States about it in 2018, talking about this idea unless there's a way that you system to work for that, people have to say we're out. I mean, frankly, that's Congress do source. So you can be honest that what you're doing as we see in a Just a quick follow-up for you, Dave. We've seen a lot of growth on the technology side on the executive branch, right? 18F, U.S. Digital Service, so both are scaling up to the uh, number in the hundreds. Is there anything you can do about Congress? Yes. Well, actually, so if anyone from Congress wants to come to 18F, we actually can work. Even though it's not separate to Congress. Um, but uh, I think a lot of it is we are tools that you use. This is part of our you know, domain that Congress probably has a lot of the same problems that we have. Um, so if we build tools that also make it great, even if we don't want to be sort of the same sort of thing. All right, one more. We have time for one more question. Right here in the front row. Hi, I uh, just want to say thank you for uh, putting this on. Seamus is not standing back there anymore. Great. Um, uh, my name is Travis Moore. I was uh, Representative Waxman's legislative director, and I appreciate this conversation. I'm attempting to start a technology fellowship for Congress. AAAS brings in scientists to do a year of science policy making and learn the institution. Robert Wood Johnson Foundation does the same with, thing with doctors. We should replicate that for Congress. Um, if there were, what what do you what do you see as the the sort of the biggest opportunity in terms of um, uh, substantive, substantively, what could be done? Whether we're talking about open data, whether we're talking about policy making, whether we're talking about uh, communications infrastructure, whether we're talking about IT infrastructure, and is there a place within the institution that you all think leadership committees, individual members, that would be um, a good place to start? Me too. For, okay. If I answer this one, it's going to sound like a commercial. <laughs> Seriously, and I, I'm not here to, to do Microsoft commercials. The, one, the thing that I see is the easiest lift. What, what congressional office doesn't prepare every day a briefing book for their member of Congress? Paper based, right? It's, you spend a lot of time putting the schedule in it, in it every brief, the uh, council's memo for the markup, the to-do list, the pre-reads. And the moment it steps out of the office, it's out of date. And it's a static document, not electronic. And it comes back eight hours later at the end of the day with a bunch of scraps of paper, a bunch of scribbles on it, a bunch of to-dos. That can be automated. The easiest thing, honestly, I think, from my perspective, for any congressional office to do to be more efficient is to make that electronic notebook, which is something that we do, and I love doing it, because it is easy. You know, you use a one-note notebook, and you synchronize it across your scheduler, your chief of staff, your LD, you get everything in there. The moment it walks out the door, you keep updating it, you change the schedule as necessary, you add new documents, you fix mistakes, and you see what the boss is checking off on their to-do list and what the news they're sending back to the office. That's easy, and it's free, and it's cross-platform. So yeah, I'm trying to think of, so my wife was a former uh, Senate staff. I'm trying to think of what her pain was. Um, I honestly, I think the answer to the question is that you want to talk to a lot of staff. Um, I just don't, I don't have enough information. Um, you think. Um, I do, I, I probably, to pick up Daniel's that I crossed over. I do structural statistics are I don't for a lot of things probably to sync that. I think that a lot of that track. Um, but what I think would be there was a way to get quick early visible that members could touch. See 
that would be the thing that's that the did. Um, so they could say, oh, wow, this is possible. Get it done quickly. That would be my recommendation, whatever that is. I mean, with they, the best thing is, you know, it's from the what the member sees and goes, wow, that, I mean, they, I didn't know, realize we could do something like that. Then it's going to be a lot easier to get them to buy in to a lot more of that. So. I mean, one, one thing that this is just jumping to mind is a site called Scout. Um, Sunlight, Sunlight Foundation created it. That um, and this, is, this is a real life experience for me. Scout is a thing that searches the United States uh, bills, it searches US GAO reports, it searches even state legislature bills, like, and it collects them all into one Google like. You know, search place that gives you reports. And I remember telling my wife about this, and she actually got a report, and I got a report uh, on different topics where we knew before members of Congress staff knew, right? So this was like a thing where you go, wait, this is a free service. It's made available, and I could just and I called up the staff and said, you know what? Like, well, now there was something called something like leadership. So maybe that's the sort of thing where like people say, oh, well, I can get it. That if it's open source and everybody has access to it, it's not a gift to the uh, to Congress. But you have to provide on equal terms. Right. 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 Anybody else? Uh, I was just going to say, like you're talking, you're looking at the guy, literally this guy, who when we tried to link web page in federal election, actually our two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> So this kind of stuff is it's the same. I was just reacting that same crazy. I, and I agree, if open source that can solve the problem. But and but that was open. I mean, anybody should, can put the link up on. on but we actually had to fight. For it. Actually, small things like that is crazy. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Um, one of the things that's striking to me as as an old time has generation before Rob even I think uh, congressional staffer is that the number of um, in between Joe and uh, is the, the number of people that are interested in this stuff, passionate about this stuff, and willing to sort of throw themselves into uh, making it a little bit better. That number has grown, and it's sort of great to see. And there's a ton of those people in the room tonight, so thank you all for coming. Uh, and we, Seamus is going to give some notes on the next couple of days, but just if we could give a hand for panelists and to you all for coming. That's great. Wow. <laughs> Before we get back to the bar, I think we have some logistics now. And before logistics, let's give Nancy a wonderful <laughs> round of applause. I do realize I stand between you and drinks, so I will make this rather um, scheduling announcements for the rest of Hack for Congress. Uh, doors open at Google. Uh, tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., 8 a.m. to 9, 9.15 registration. Um, then we're going to have some uh, welcoming remarks from Susan Molinari of Google, and then Ron, Senator Ron Wyden from Oregon, and Senator John Thune from South Dakota. Uh, and then we'll get hacking. Uh, happy hour at 6 tomorrow night, right across the street from Google, so you don't have to go more than 100 yards. Uh, and then all day Friday, we'll be hacking starting at 9 at Google again. And all of this information is on hackforcongress.org. If you have not yet registered and would like to join us, uh, we still have a couple slots left. And tomorrow morning, we will be giving out uh, bracelets for the private concert on Friday night, um, which is an award ceremony, a celebration of all things Hack for Congress congressional information with clap your hands, say yeah. Um, so hopefully, uh, y'all will be able to join. Um, so now, on to the bar. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Take care.